All right, this is Kamal Freeman, um, We Act Radio. We are here at the Congressional Black Caucus uh, Policy for the People Health Equity Summit. I'm joined here today by Raza Young Daniel, the CEO and founder of Black Health Matters, and Dr. George Crea Perry, the National Birth Equity Collaborative. Ladies, you got both did such a fabulous job on the panel. I was honored to speak to both of you, but uh, even under these auspicious um, conditions. Now, America is the only industrialized nation that doesn't provide, refuses to provide health care for all of its citizens. Mm -hmm. How much is that directly connected to the negative outcomes that we find in the black communities? I think it's everything. Mm -hmm. You know, why is it that we are one of the global world powers, but black folks fare just as well as we did if we lived in a much poorer nation. Mm -hmm. So it's all based on race. Mm -hmm. The color of our skin dictates how long we're going to live, how we thrive. And I always joke, people will say, well, what about if I'm on a certain zip code? Or I'm a professional. Doesn't matter. Stats will show that you will die much sooner than your next door neighbor. Even black physicians yep. have a much higher mortality rate than their white counterpart. And the only thing that can explain that is race. You know, and I'll just add that well, we are the only industrialized nation that doesn't have health codified as a right. Okay, so. President Joe Biden is the first U.S. president to say out loud that health is a right. What he has not done yet is then make some steps towards that belief system. So in countries where they believe health is a right, they ensure that all citizens have health insurance coverage. So what that would mean physically in the United States is you would have access to um, Medicare for all, not getting rid of your private insurance, but if you are a person who would just like to buy Medicare because you don't want the, your job to take out the insurance out of your check, or if you are a person who doesn't have access through employer based insurance, you would have access to Medicare. We can't even get that in this country. That was kicked out of the ACA. Well, Barack Obama tried to add that in, and that was kicked out. But it's an opportunity for our current president and his current platform to add back in that he believes health is a right, and so therefore we should have access to Medicare for all. So yes, it is huge that we have millions of people, especially black people, who don't have health coverage, um, and we are dying because we do not have access to primary care, preventive care. You mentioned that negative health, health outcomes attached to your zip code. Mm -hmm. Here in the nation's capital, there is, I believe, um, 20 to 25 year uh, disparity in um, life expectancy from one zip code to another in the same city. Yeah. Uh, can you speak to those? Yeah, for sure. I mean, we were able to, if you overlay the redlining map for that exact thing that you're talking about, so um, the District of Columbia, along with most um, cities across the United States, were legally segregated by government. So not just banks said no. The government, through Fannie Mae and Franny's, um, um, through Fannie Mae said you cannot get loans in these neighborhoods. So that same undervaluing of those communities where they can't, you can't get loans to start small businesses because you usually use the equity in your house to start a small business. All right, so this can, ends up where we have then healthcare and health inequities now 50 years later, 75 years later. They are structured by the policy decisions in those neighborhoods. So you see in New Orleans, 25 year difference between people in one part of the community in one zip code versus another. We've done this, Robert Wood Johnson did this, uh, that map probably 20 years ago and we, we, we keep talking about it, what we haven't been able to do is to get policymakers to act upon it, which would require you to do things like invest in infrastructure in the redlined areas because you know that you did not invest in them for the last hundred years. I heard, now y'all tell me who said this. Mm -hmm. It has been often said that black people live sicker and die quicker. Mm. Who gave me that? That would be you. <laughs> now where did that come from? That came from a book uh, called The Color of the... Uh, it's a new book by Linda Villarosa, mm -hmm. who is an outstanding health equity author and was author, also a writer of the 1619 Project mm -hmm. from the New York Times. And that is just an old saying that black Americans just live sick and we just expire. Yeah, because I heard it's been said that when black, uh, when the, the nation catches a cold, black people catch pneumonia. I've heard that one. Right. But this was a new one on me. Yeah. Um, Martin Luther King said that of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. Mm -hmm. So apparently we've been dealing with these issues for um, a long time. Why do you think it's still persistent and why do you think that we're still dealing with the same issues today? And not even, even before Martin Luther King, Du Bois, right? Du Bois wrote, as a sociologist, wrote about health inequities and how black infant mortality um, was tied to how we were being treated as human beings. So that until we have some truth-telling about the devaluation 
of black bodies, um, we're gonna continue to see health inequity. So that is why we still have the same conversations uh, that uh, Du Bois said, that Martin Luther King said, and um, that you and I are sitting here, the three of us are having today. And, and can I just add mm -hmm. that, again, when we were enslaved in this country, the only way that you know, Polly Ann and Sue Beth mm -hmm. and Joe Bob could kind of rationalize it is to make us less than human. Yes. And so that's why, again, the father mm -hmm. of GYN Health mm -hmm. performed atrocious mm -hmm. surgeries mm -hmm. on black women without anesthesia. Yeah. Even his peers thought it was cruel and unusual and refused to work with him. So he trained other people who were enslaved. Yeah. And he, you know, he was the president of the American Medical Association. So he was honored despite the fact that he was treating us, harming us. And then he then was found in New York years later after the Civil War with the women who was, he supposedly um, fixed their health issues and they still had the exact same health issues. So it was he a was a quack. He was a quack. So it's a continuation of people use us, make money off of us, use us when I say us, I mean black people, right? So they still, they want all of our um, rhythm, but don't want our blues, right? So they. Right. <laughs> so again, when you look at historically, mm -hmm. if you have to, if, and it is institutionalized, right. right? That we are not as whole, we yeah. are not people. Mm -hmm. So to this day, you can go into a doctor, mm -hmm. and they won't treat you for something, things, certain things, because they say black folks don't feel pain. Exactly. Mm -hmm. There's certain skin issues mm -hmm. that they don't teach them in medical school that they need to look at for black skin. So if they see it present, they'll just ignore it. So all of that is still a vestige of racism in this country, and it's not going away anytime soon. So we point out how um, systemic uh, racism, white supremacy uh, in this country uh, has um, put up roadblocks and, and impediments to having health care, universal health care for all uh, in this country. But here in the nation's capital, uh, we have the uh, highest maternal mortality rate in the country, one of the highest infant mortality rates in the country. It's the most dangerous city for a black woman to give birth in the country. Mm -hmm. But yet, and still, uh, our leadership is headed by a black woman in, in the mayor's office, a black woman in, in the congressional office. How do we wrestle with that? How do we reconcile that yeah. when we are actually in charge and still have some of the same negative, or in this case, some of the worst right. health outcomes? Well, I think we're still trying to understand that racism and not race is why we have poor outcomes. And when I say that phrase, for so long, race was seen as a biological thing. So like, I was taught in medical school that they were, and I'm not that old, that there were three biological races, mongoloid, caucasoid, and negroid. So that means that the people who are 50 years old or older, or maybe even some who are younger, believe the reason we have health inequities is because there's something broken, something biological about blackness. Well, there is, that was always a lie. There is no biological basis of race. There is no black kidney, no black gene, no black um, lung capacity. So when you think about the leadership in a city like Washington, D.C., they're surrounded by people who believe, even if they don't themselves believe it, believe that black people are inherently broken, that the reason we have higher rates of crime, higher rates of obesity, higher rates of maternal mortality is because either we have a genetic predisposition to it or we just make bad decisions. So until we can have an honest conversation even within the black community about that there is no brokenness, the only thing wrong with black people is racism. The only thing that makes us not have the things that we should have, that's why despite income or education, so a black woman who has a college degree or higher is still more likely to die in childbirth than a white woman with no high school education. So that is not about our genes, that is not about our choices, these are structural and political decisions. So we have to hold our mayors and our Congress people accountable and say, what are we gonna to do to proactively end the harm? I, I believe DC should be giving free healthcare to everybody. It is a rich city. Um, if you could practice doing a, a Medicare for all just in the District of Columbia, nobody here should be without food, it should be without healthcare because there is so much money in our budget and how we decide to spend it, I don't mean to point at you like that, but how we decide to spend it is really important and we are not deciding to spend it on the people who are the most um, Heard it here first. <laughs> Heard it here first. You know, uh, our budget is a moral document. I think we have a, some immoral documents. We do, right? we do, we do. I mean, we do a lot of developing. I mean, this is a city who has a lot of buildings. I mean, New Orleans is the same thing. I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to pick on D.C. as if it's the only place. Across the United States, urban areas are doing a lot of development, a lot of condos, a lot of high-income apartments where people can't afford. People have to move further and further out. Um, from Detroit to New Orleans to DC. And these are decisions that we're not investing in the human capital, not just building new buildings. But, well, DC is overwrought now with the buildings. We have so much infrastructure and not enough 
investment in actual human beings and lives. We have economic development, not community. There development. we go. All right. Um, Ms. Young Daniels, <laughs> anything you care to add? No. Oh, that, that, <laughs> that will be it. <laughs> All right, ladies, uh, it was such a joy to, to sit here and, and, and uh, have this, this conversation. But what can we do right now to improve or offset these outcomes with, on the ground level? What will you um, espouse that people should be doing? Yeah, this I mean, is We Act Radio. Our motto is to do something. Yes, Marisha, can I just go, go first? first please. I know she's going to close it down. <laughs> um, so one of the things we advocate is sign up for a Black Health Matters newsletter. Yes. It's free. You'll get it once a week, sometimes twice a week. It's going to give you everything you need to know about Black Health. It'll link you to the Black Health Matters website, provide access to resources. You'll know where we are, where we're doing events, where there are free screenings. So I think that's a great step because, again, your doctor really is only going to count for basically 20% exactly. of what happens to you. The remainder, 80, are the steps that you take to further your life in a healthy way so that you can thrive. So take that responsibility, get our newsletter, read it. You know, I would love to see a truth and reconciliation event, opportunity happen in the District of Columbia. Like, what does it look like to sit down and talk about how do we get to these health inequities in this city? And then what are we gonna do with, with this truthful conversation to build out better? We're talking about this at the UN level. So we, there's a, a people of African descent um, UN conference. And so we're trying to set a, a global conversations for people of African descent about the truth of the transatlantic slave trade and lynching. And you could start doing this right here in and right, the generations of mental health and trauma yes. that was passed on. Yeah, Think about it. that. Everybody's traumatized. Exactly. Babies, exactly. little girls, everybody's exactly. traumatized. Exactly. Families exactly. traumatized. For years. Exactly. And you know, Linda, who wrote the book that you mentioned, she wrote the article in the New York Times that really got the black maternal health um, into the public ethos. That's what you have to do to hold them accountable. Mm -hmm. You have to have events, media events, you have to have, and that will make our policymakers have to make different choices because we're getting to their subconscious that this is wrong and bad. This is not something they can ignore. Building more buildings is not going to save us. Mm -hmm. We have to work together to save each other. And again, it's, like you said, it's about being woke. And so yes. I just equated to, you know, when we first were enslaved mm -hmm. in this country, as soon as we became free, the first thing we did mm -hmm. was we ran out and started schools. Exactly. And that's so unprecedented, it right? A whole bunch of schools, north, south, east, and exactly. west. So education is important to us. It is. Then we decided we needed to vote. We were ready to die. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, when it comes to this next hurdle, which is health, mm -hmm. we, we're kind of hitting up against the wall. We True. have to understand and let people know that we can break through. And I think it's organizations like this, mm -hmm. environments like this, mm -hmm. and ideas like Dr. Claire Perry has that'll help us kick through those barriers mm -hmm. so that we can see um, scalable change. Yeah. Standard change that's scalable. Yeah, health for everybody in D.C. would be reparations. <laughs> Bam! I'm telling you! <laughs> All right, so. Whoa! Whoa. All right. There we have it. There we have it. I'm stealing that. Yeah, yeah, we're working with it. I'm stealing <laughs> it's on that. record. It's on record. Whoa. So we've been listening to Dr. Joy uh, Career Perry, President of National Health Equity um, Collaborative, uh, physician, policy expert, thought leader, and advocate for transformational justice, <laughs> as you just heard. Uh, also, uh, Rosalind Young Daniels, CEO and founder of Black Health Matters, the visionary force behind. Uh, a preeminent online health promotion and disease management platform. And earlier, we spoke with George uh, C. Benjamin, Executive Director of the American Public Health Association. He is known as one of the nation's most influential physician leaders. Uh, now, it was, um, a lot of people are familiar with Martin Luther King's last speech, but we're not as familiar with his next to his last speech that was actually delivered right here in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. March 31st, 1968. It was entitled, Remaining Awake, doing a great revolution. Yeah. You said stay woke earlier, so that triggered this. <laughs> and he said in that speech that far too often people find themselves living in periods of great social change, but yet they fail to develop the new ideas, the new mental responses, the new situation mm. demands. They end up sleeping mm -hmm. through a revolution. Mm. I submit that's the quintessential definition of stay woke. Yes. And I think that we are in the midst of a great revolution. And I think that we are, it's up to us to rise to that occasion because one of the things he espoused was the revolution of values. Yes. 
And I think that's what you were basically were saying, yeah. uh, Dr. Craig, was a revolution of violence. And we we'll take that revolution of violence for us to, to address these outcomes. Mm -hmm. And with you guys as thought leaders, uh, and you know, the people with the will and the people with the skill can come together and maybe we can change some of this. All right? All right. Thank you for all the work that you guys are doing. Uh, this has been Kimon Freeman of We Act Real on the radical side of Monarchy Avenue. Do something. <laughs>